we don't know what's going on, but we do know that these are... <clears throat> oh, I know what. Hand me that book. Yeah. Hand me that book on the top shelf that says, Where Did the Towers Go? It's, it's, oh, yes. We've done a whole thing on that. Oh, you have? I just want to point out what the satellites, uh, weaponized satellites can do. Yeah. Okay, we'll have that. That's a brilliant book. Now, have you interviewed Judy? We've interviewed a guy in England called Andrew Johnson who has okay. Judy around, and we've done a whole program on it. Okay, that. good, because I know Andy and, um, and Judy. You and, know uh, Andrew Johnson yeah. in England? Yeah. Yeah, he's a good boy. <clears throat> we've got dragons on the table and crystals. What does all this mean, the real John Lear? Uh, we have them to uh, eat Nassim, who's... <laughs> <laughs> this is shocking. We he just have our... his own crystals, and they are... The, the point with the crystals, they, can, they streamline energies. Right. And uh, so the... Okay, we've heard enough about that. Yeah. So let's, the dragons, have, let's hear something know. about this. Okay. And the crystals, your, your mother's? Yeah, the crystal I gave to my mom um, many years ago, and then when she passed away, I took it and put it down here for my dragons to guard. And do you have names for your dragons? No, no name. Do they need feeding? Pardon? Do you need? Do they need feeding? Uh, yeah, that's that's what we're waiting to do with Nassim. <laughs> well done. Okay, John, secret space programs. Okay, this is an example of what those orbiting, <clears throat> 24 orbiting satellites that we put up there, incidentally, in addition to the 24 orbiting satellites, we've got two command and control, and this is run by SPAWAR, or the Navy operation, if you uh, tune in on the uh, web, just dial in SPA, uh, W-A-R, SPAWAR, and you'll see everything that uh, they do. Anyway, of those 24, satellites, uh, some of them have different technologies. This technology is called uh, molecular dissociation. And what it does is it uh, disassoci disassociates the molecular uh, composition of uh, uh, a property, either a steel or, or steel and concrete, down to dust. And the interesting thing is that it doesn't stop there. It, it goes on to, to nothing. That's why, and that's called non-self-quenching. <clears throat> that's why when we see the World Trade Center, uh, that we see a big, huge pond there. Because the original, original project uh, idea for the World Trade Center was to build buildings right there, but, you know, much bigger, much taller and everything. But everything they put up there immediately decayed. Uh, rust would uh, rust the steel almost instantaneously, within a couple of days, it would just rust to nothing. So they had to move a pool there, and that pool is trying to absorb the non-self-quenching uh, abilities of this, of whatever they did, because this was the first time that they'd fired it <clears throat> at that uh, huge uh, capacity. So now when you have, have a uh, look down on there, you'll see the buildings and then the water in between. So we hope the new so we hope the new trade center is going to stick stand, keep standing. It'd be interesting to see what uh, what's going on. I haven't followed it really that uh, closely, but uh, it should stay up. So, what sort of further use would they have with such technology? For what? What further use would they have with uh, such technology, having used it on 9/11? Where do you think this is taking us? Well, it's a combination. It's not only weapons. They can, uh, uh, along with harp. They can uh, make and uh, motivate, guide uh, hurricanes. That's how Hurricane Aaron got up to 100 miles off the coast during 9-11, uh, six days before they generated it and then walked it up the coast and it just sat there and they used part of the hurricane uh, as the force for what they're doing with the molecular dissociation. Now, I don't know how they do it, that's what we're working on to find out. That's what they've, they've figured out, but I haven't figured it out yet. Same thing with Katrina. <clears throat> they made Katrina and uh, got it uh, boiling and everything and then walked it right straight into New Orleans 
for whatever purpose, you know, they, it was a social experiment or whatever they wanted to do. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, uh, Oklahoma City, the Mira building, they did the same thing. You can take, uh, I think there's a photo in here that you can put right next to the photos of the uh, World Trade Center, and it's the same identical um, uh, damage that uh, was done at the Mira building as was done on 9-11. Uh, so the explosions on 9-11, what was that about then? Which ones? The basement? The, yeah, the, the explosions in the building before, you know, it fell and, and they've been reported by many. Yeah, yeah, I see, you can see them go pop, 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 pop. I don't know what, uh, what they are. The extra measure to make it fall? But did people see planes or what did they see? If they saw a plane, it was a holograph because there was no other, there was no real planes there. As a pilot, is it feasible for somebody to fly a jet aircraft in the way that those th three planes flew? Not the first time. Uh, if he had practice, like uh, four or five times, he could have done it, but not the first time. Now you support, uh, or you have a, you mentioned something about the pilots for 9-11? Truth for 9-11, is that right? Uh, yeah, pilots uh, for Truth 9-11. Uh, I'm a core member of that, but uh, uh, the problem was they will not consider that there were no airplanes, at least the, uh, the management. Now, maybe some other people do, but, but I consider that there, I'm what you call a no-planer. There were no planes on 9-11. Uh, but people have a hard time believing that, and I don't know well, why. Well, they all saw it on TV. It must be real. And not only <laughs> that, they heard it. Yeah, and that's that's the problem. And uh, I saw it on TV. <clears throat> Therein leaves the problem. People think uh, they see it on TV. It must be real. They saw they saw the moon landing on TV. I saw it. I watched them get out. <laughs> I know people who were down there who saw it flew in to the building. So they saw it. I believe it can have, it could have been a hologram, but it, you believe what? I believe it could have been a hologram. Yeah. You know, I. Uh, but I know people who said we saw it flew in, standing on the ground, and we heard the sounds. So it, it it's not like it's only made for TV. It's bigger than that. In case that's true. But I also can tell you that Russell Targ. He told me back at the first, that when I went to the convention, the UFO convention, he s I asked him about this, and he said this was a hologram. He said, and I, I couldn't believe it, but you know, now there are more people saying it. Well, the, the point is, how can they project holograms of that size? Here, that, and therein lies the problem, because people are, uh, when you say hologram, they're thinking of a Walt Disney little pixie dancing around in a little um, um, darkness area, uh, that's all they know about holograms. They don't know that 20 years ago uh, we could project a hologram uh, with uh, heat, uh, noise, light, speed, anything we wanted, anywhere. And uh, <clears throat> we used that on 9-11. Uh, right now, the television industry is ready uh, to bring out uh, television uh, quality programs that you could put right on your desk and you have a little <clears throat> a little thing here it, you can raise it up like this I mean you can enlarge it uh, you can bring it down to small you can move it over there you can move it over there wherever you want and it looks just like there and you can stand all around it and see from all sides <clears throat> and uh, the Japanese uh, a year ago announced that not only do they have that but they uh, they have it um, uh, they have touchy-feely 3D holograms that you can touch it. Uh, Ten years ago, they invited uh, <clears throat> 30 of the uh, top TV uh, industrials, producers and stuff, and uh, similar to that, they took them into a uh, small theater uh, that accommodated about 40 or 50 people and sat them down and they said the future of television. A normal light like that, the lights didn't go out, and the guy comes from behind the curtain, he looked uh, maybe uh, well over 60, uh, white hair, uh, glasses, uh, when he started talking, is obviously uh, Eastern European, uh, with an accident, <clears throat> he started talking about uh, the TV, how 
the uh, the uh, tubes were initially made, the cathode ray tubes, and uh, how it developed into this and that and so on. And it, as he's talking, he gets off the podium, walks up one aisle, down that aisle, looks at the audience, takes off his glasses, cleans him, walks up one aisle, down another aisle, gets back up on the podium. Everybody, by about this time, everybody's getting bored of stuff they've already heard. And he says, uh, well, um, I want to thank you very much. And then just turned him off like that in front of everybody. <laughs> wow. It's just like what you're saying, but this is what they can do, but they can't bring it in right now because it's too close to 9-11. People are going to associate, you know, when they were yelling at John Lear, you know, five years ago saying this was possible and saying it's impossible. There has to be a screen. There has to be a background. There has to be something we can project it on. You know, it's bullshit. They don't know what's going on or how things develop, so... John, I'm disturbed. What? I mean, you, Nassim and Anna, you know, how can her paradigms, but tell me this, John, who on earth could possibly disagree with anything you say? <laughs> Nassim? Nobody, I know. <laughs> they told me this. And what do you feel about these guys? And you have fun. Yeah. That was a question, not a statement. Oh, what was the question? How do I feel about it? The bad guys, these people who do this kind of thing. What's that? Oh. <laughs> How do they get the stuff up there? Who's going up there? What's actually going on? You know, I don't know that much. How they get it up there is, uh, uh, you know, when the shuttle used to go up, um, they always, uh, it only takes um, 11 minutes to uh, orbit. Uh, but we always took three days. And everybody wondered, why does it take three days? Oh, well, because there's union regulations. We've got to have uh, sleep periods, at least two eight-hour sleep periods, and then this, and then we give them off time and everything. And, and then what they're doing is they're taking up that half the cargo full and passing it off at the different satellites that are that are in operation. Plus, they have people, extra people on the uh, <clears throat> the shuttle. It was built for 10 people. Uh, we only saw, at, at the most whales, uh, saw t seven go up. It probably takes 15 people, uh, and, and they would drop them on the way up. Now, two days before the shuttle went up, what happened? They'd send two Russian rockets up to the ISS. And uh, so when the shuttle <clears throat> got to um, the station, they'd be for ten, there for 10 days, and we would, they would show us the cargo in the shuttle when it got there, and it's only half full. All that other half was stuff they let off. So now the stuff that goes on, and we had on uh, uh, livingmoon.com, we had the uh, <clears throat> list of the uh, what was put on board the Fostok um, or the um, the Russian rockets, and um, uh, there would be fruit, food, uh, parts, uh, and um, a lot of other stuff. So <clears throat> what happens up on the um, ISS, during that 10 days, they'd put all this stuff that was on the Vostoks into uh, the uh, shuttle after it was emptied. And then when the shuttle was launched to come back here, it should take 54 minutes to come down and land at Kennedy. But it always takes two and a half days. Why? Because they're dropping off all this stuff that was brought up by the Vostoks to the other satellites that was brought up by the Vostok, um, or whatever the ship was. And that's what takes so long. But we don't have a shuttle anymore. So how's it been, how's it been done? Oh yeah, we have the uh, three um, rockets that uh, have been a, a man approved for at least 10 years that I know of. And uh, man approved means that they're safety, sa safe enough to send uh, astronauts up in them. And we have the Sea Launch, uh, Delta, and uh, there's some others. I didn't have my folder, but there's uh, three or four, uh, and we launch every day. There's 24 launching sites. The public knows about Vandenberg, uh, Kennedy, and uh, there must be other, one other one. But uh, there's an additional 20 launch sites all around the world that we use uh, just specifically to keep the public from uh, knowing about all this stuff that we launch. What, what part does NATO play in the secret space program? Don't know. None? Yeah. So the, the NATO, uh, NATO partners are not being involved in any of this? Uh -uh. <coughs> I wouldn't think so. 
in Norway, there's been this big discussion because the government has decided that we are going to buy 24 uh, stealth, some stealth technology from Lockheed Martin. A big discussion because these planes were triple the price of everything else. And the, what we hear is that the, it's so unclear what works and what doesn't work. And they do experiments and it doesn't work. But still, the Norwegian government keeps paying huge amount of money, and you know, I, you wonder: is this just uh, being dropping money for? It is. That's all it is. It's for nothing because stealth, you know, was built against certain types of uh, highly uh, developed Russian radar. But that's not all the people have. The people might have some old piece of junk, which can see. You can't protect your airplane against all types of radar. Um, you know, so the problem we've had in Bosnia is the people were, that were tasking uh, the stealth fighters, they thought they were really stealth fighters. I mean, they thought they were invisible. So they sent them in during the daytime at 10,000 feet, you know. And of course, you can look up and see it. It's not that stealthy, you know. And that's where the guys got shot down. But, um, uh, you know, what would Norway ha need a an airplane for it. Well, that's the, that's a very good question because the, we have a, a very different uh, policy in this regards than than, for example, America. We don't need. We we never want to uh, attack. Right. Who are you protecting yourself planes. against? Well, the you know the the old paradigm would say we need to attack us against the Russians, but. Uh, that's not good anymore. We That's were allies. Not good anymore. We were friends and allies of the Russians since uh, after World War II, and always have been. We uh, we were allied together on the space program. We took the moon. They took Venus, uh, and it was all to um, keep the public's attention uh, directed towards this supposed Cold War mm -hmm. instead of what was really going on. And what was really going on was the secret space program and. Uh, uh, other things that the Russia and the U.S. did together. Okay, going back to World War II and the weapons-grade material used on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what really happened with the German technology and what happened with the German saucers and all that stuff? Okay, what happened I with the... to the recent work of Joseph Farrell. Yeah, what really happened is the... Uh, um, with the weapons-grade uh, plutonium... We couldn't produce that. We could make the mechanism of the bomb. Well, well, what about the bomb that went up that we all saw in the cinema at the time? In the where? In the cinema. We didn't have television. What about the little, the, the first big explosions? We all, we all saw those nuclear blasts. Well, are you talking about in Japan? No, I'm talking about uh, the, uh, the Manhattan Project. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. We couldn't produce the plutonium, but we could produce the mechanism. Whereas Germany... Yeah, but we saw them blast. We saw that... Okay. Was that awful? Okay, just, just let me finish. We couldn't produce the plutonium, but we could produce the mechanism. Germany could produce the plutonium, but not the mechanism. They realized they were going to lose this war, so they came and asked for a deal. We'll give you the plutonium... Uh, if you'll uh, let us in after the war. And we said yes. So they gave us the plutonium, which we used at Trinity, and then at, uh, <clears throat> and then at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. That was Nazi plutonium. And then we started letting them in after World War II. So, yeah. so the deal was made in 1944 or 1943 then? What? The deal between Germany and America was done before the war ended. It was done in 1944. Yeah. Yeah, um, the details of that are in uh, Jim Marr's book right over there, and uh, he deals that uh, not only the uh, negotiations, but exactly how they transferred it, uh, the plutonium. And what about the anti-gravity stuff that, that, that some people are referring to? The John Irwin book refers to flying saucers in the Syrian desert in 1958-59. Uh, other people are referring to a, a funny, or a um, there's a current movie out called Iron Sky, mm -hmm which is a comedy about how the Germans survived World War II, had an Antarctic base, and then established a lunar base. What about that? I'm sure that uh, my dad, being part of the anti-gravity system in 1952, continued through until 1956. I think that was the uh, completion of the program. And yes, they had anti-gravity, and all they did was refine and make it better and better and better. So the stuff that we saw in 1958, 1959 uh, was 
the culmination of uh, the anti-grav that uh, we were doing. Bearing in mind Syria is where most of the German gold apparently is buried. Really? Yeah. They, uh, they smuggle it out in little small trinkets. It's a different gold, different grade of gold. Hmm. Now, we use the term anti-gravity. It's not the right term. What's the actual drive mechanism? What does things actually push against or pull against? Somebody told me that the other day, and I can't remember what it was. Somebody came, said, it's not anti-gravity. What is it? And there's a, a neat word, and I can't remember. I'll email it to you. Okay. It's just canceling out gravity. It's just... No gravity. Go ahead. What? It's to do with the fabric of space-time. We live in a multi-dimensional universe, and the, the astronomers observe it with a two-dimensional instrument and get an accurate uh, representation of what's out there. Yeah, well, everything in our solar system is, uh, <clears throat> is a... Uh, let me see if I can get the right word. Uh, is a um, illusion. Uh, it's not really here. This is just an illusion for a place for us to learn and to grow and to mature our souls. Once you get out of the solar system, everything has changed. There's not one mathematical formula or color or anything that uh, is the same after we get out of the solar system. But right now, everything in here, uh, for instance, if we think we're going uh, out in time um, and we, oh yeah, I was out at... Uh, Alpha Centauri, that's not, that's not true. We were bypassed and we stay right in here in the uh, solar system while all this is, is going, while we're maturing. It's built specially for us. By whom and what about this, these, these shielded planets? Um, by those guys, I don't know. Uh, the guys that uh, made us, I don't know. It goes so far up, I don't have any clue. The shielded planets, uh, there's 40 planets within our solar system and uh, there's some closer than Pluto, some further away. And uh, they hide them in several different technologies. One is uh, mirrors, and, uh, and then there are other technologies, and I don't know about those. What about the, Ger the Russians being given Venus, you mentioned? Uh, no, we split up the, um, the tasks uh, to, um, to do uh, space-wise. And... We said uh, the, to the Russians, they agreed to photograph Venus while we were working on going to the moon. In other words, we didn't waste our time and effort going to, to Venus. But since we didn't go to the moon, what's really going on there? And what about the bases on the back of the moon? You know, the back of the moon, I wish I could show you some pictures. There's some great, I'll show you some other pictures on the back of the moon. I don't like people say that. It's so full of towns and cities and factories and everything, when people say bases on the back of the moon, I think of a you know barren wasteland with just one little fortress back there, but it's not. There's just so much going on. This picture up here, you just look at it, <clears throat> and you can see roads and, and buildings and, and all kinds of you know houses and all kinds of stuff up there. And then we'll walk around and show you um, some other... You want to go up there? We'll do that later. I'm, I'm, right okay. up. I'm looking right at that right now. Well, so bases, you know, you think of a little fortress. It's not like that. I mean, there's a huge cities like that. And you have to laugh when people, you know, say, well, Buzz Aldrin, land, Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. You know, would he touch down on one of those streets there and just, you know, it's crazy. I don't see any streets there. Where is this? Can be a good we'll to get up close. You can't see it from where you are. Uh, when you talk about the solar system, are you talking about the lo local solar system, right. our sun? And as far as Pluto. As, as far as I've learned, it, this uh, the Milky Way is kind of a spin-off of the Andromeda galaxy. Do you, is that to your... So, Milky so, Way. The, the Milky Way is our galaxy. Yeah. Andromeda is a, an, another what million miles or yes, thousand still, million? Yes, still it's a spin off. The other was we uh, originally the Milky Way was part of the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. Who uh, somehow moved away <laughs> for some. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, I'm talking about just as far as Pluto. And uh, Nassim's explanation for this is quite elegant. No, and we've had that scene. 
Yeah, but I'm Let's off the camera. I can say this, can I? Yes, you can. Go ahead. And that is the fact that what is considered solid is actually 99.99 in some degree nothingness or space between molecules or protons and things. So we are basically nothingness or and the the fact that we are moving with the speed of light between uh, in and out of reality so we don't notice this that's why and this technology can in a higher te uh, technological uh, culture be used to move instantly from one end of the universe to another one mm. thank you anna go ahead you men are so arrogant, you know, God just... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you, you were meant to see that, you know, yeah. to impress you or something. That's cool. So, God. and I'm sure a few others have got access to this kind of technology. Yeah. And he is a conspiracy theorist. Well, you know, Poof won't take him to Mars, but... Yeah. So... Funny to, to see. I love this thing. Yeah, I'm just. You love what? I love these uh, the explanation because oh. it's so elegant, mm. and it 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 makes you understand things, and it, it's very coherent with what you observe in nature and everything. So What's she talking about? Um, I'm talking yeah. about NASA, right? The the resonance project. Yes, we're not talking about that. We're with John Lear, and we're going to close <laughs> this yeah, well. wonderful time with John, having a good time. We're listening. He's going to play for us. What the real John Lear infers that there may be other John Lears who may masterfully mimic your extraordinary abilities. Is there anything behind that? Mm -mm. No, there isn't. <laughs> what about cloning people? Would you, would you, have you any... Uh, yeah, I told you that Cecil told me that uh, he said, what do you know about cloning? And I said, nothing. He says, if you could just be a little mouse in my pocket, you can't imagine what we've got going over in Saudi Arabia. And so he and, you know, Sol obviously Solom had showed him something, but uh, Solom died a couple of years ago. He really loved to fly these ultralights, but he was crazy pilot. He knew nothing, you know, barely got every, every place he went. And uh, he died uh, taking off at, and he loved to fly at sunset, and he hit some wires in Houston. and. Uh, died but uh, he was the half brother of uh, Osama and um, he, he did a lot, he had a lot of things going and had access to a lot of secrets so so have we you were been told by someone that to what to how to behave or have they been after you mm -mm. so concentrating on this final moment about the super soldier program about what the super, super soldier so yeah. super soldiers what do you know about the super soldier program on the mass cloning that you just referred to how widespread is this? What's going on there? Uh, I don't know how, how widespread is it. I know there's in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, I know they keep them in Saudi Arabia. I don't know whether they've used them or not, uh, but um, I was certainly interested in the bases um, <clears throat> video. You, the two girls from, uh, what were they, Norway? Madness in the fast lane. The no, Sweden. They were Sweet. Swedish. They were Swedish. Swedish, yeah. That was an interesting story. Yeah, I felt that was a demonstration of the technology in, in, in plain sight and must therefore have had some kind of a weapon strategy because you don't demonstrate a weapon system unless you've got some person who you want to see it. There's another, there's another aspect of this uh, uh, conspiracy and that is the... I uh, don't want to bring you all in the secret societies and all that, but there are these secret bases underground for special... Uh, chosen or super rich or somebody and one of them was in Colorado underneath and there was one in Washington and so on and not long ago there was this earthquakes that was shallow and they were seen the rumors has it on the internet that they were destroyed do you know that's a story we heard I don't know whether it happened or not but we have you know at least 50 underground secret bases uh, as far as cities for so, the higher ups in the United States, for some reason, have made plans for some disastrous thing to happen to the United States. Uh, they obviously believe it's going to happen because they've made a lot of, of uh, plans and, and uh, 
things, uh, roads, uh, uh, railroads, underground cities, storing of food, all that stuff underground for whatever's going to come. You know, I, I don't think any's going to come myself. But oh, this is what they've been planning for. Well, this this is earthquake. something that David Wilcock has come up with. But it came. We initially in England uh, found that there were a number of explosions, instant uh, seismic disturbances, not a gradual quake, and these occurred in areas which are known to or rumoured to have underground bases of some description. That's namely in Cumbria, South Yorkshire, Cornwall, and Kent. Basically, four points in the uh, in England. Yeah, interesting. They were, they were all uh, roughly the same depth and all roughly the same uh, power, which was really determined by where the sensor was which picked them up. Yeah. And this was happened about a year before any of the stuff happening, or a good nine months before anything was happening in the US. And subsequent entirely circumstantial evidence implies there is some kind of an ET or non-human, strictly speaking, not necessarily ET, but a non-human source or origin to this kind of technology. Um, do you have any words on non-humans versus ETs? The difference. Ancient Earth races. No, no, yeah. No. What about the, the Norwegian spiral, so-called? Those were really interesting. Oh, boy, what, I like those. Opinion, what, what, what no. I don't know. What were they? Let's ask Nassim. Bifiler, a bifiler uh, Tesla uh, spiral. Nassim has an absolute ironclad answer to that one, right? Uh, no, no, you're talking to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, well, uh, let's go walk about and see what's going on okay. with some of these wonderful pictures. Can I unplug here? Yeah, unplug, yeah. We'll go local. See, oh, here yeah. this road comes down here, yeah. and the road here, and then all these little houses and buildings and what Nancy's that, done. That looks like Vegas. Those are... <laughs> those are, you know, those are factories where they've taken a little black and taken off some corners, strategic corners, so you can't make a building out of it in your eyes. Uh, but uh, right here, all this stuff there, look at those roads there. Now, these long, straight ones, those are where they, they join the... Um, the pictures. Yeah, the pictures. Yeah. So those can't be counted. No. But these, look, going yeah, down, down there, yeah. there's a little airplane waiting to be flown. Uh, you know, factories, all all that stuff, and uh, mm. yeah, there's there's some angles here that's not. Uh, uh, now major. over there, that was in 1968. I was flying a uh, Cessna to Australia, and I lost an engine. I had to come back under the bridge, so it was a slow news day, and they took pictures of this Cessna 320 flying under the bridge. Uh, You're talking about this. The right. top, which one? The top with those newspaper articles? Yeah. And uh, this is my special operations. I've been a member of that for like 30 years. And it's just a group of former special ops guys that meets here in Las Vegas every year. And then over here... Um, where, are, where are we? I'm not following here. you. This was uh, Geneva, Switzerland, the Weekly Tribune. That's when I got my aerobatic license. It says stunt pilot at 17, and uh, this over here is, uh, I was flying in Cairo, and the airline was called Air Sinai, and that's my uh, crew with me. This is at the top of the Matterhorn, and this is my certificate for climbing the Matterhorn, August 7th, 1959, and uh, this is Everest, and my, uh, this is Everest, and this is the Hillary Step right there. Yeah. And just because I have, I'm interested in that, I had that picture, but I was never there. Um, yeah, Alice I met in Geneva, actually outside of Geneva. And uh, this is Air Sinai, this is in Paris, this is the Learjet. Um, this is flying at Grumman TBM. This is climbing down Sinai. The, the climb up is just a road you walk along around the back. And then when you come down, you come down the steps of St. Catharines, and those steps they built, and I took those pictures of walking on down. This is the MiG that intercepted me up uh, by the Kuril Islands when I set the round the world speed record. And uh, this is when I flew the... Well, tell us more about the round the world speed record. Uh, 1966, I went with uh, two other factory pilots 
and a NAA observer. And we went from, left Wichita, went to Bradley Field, St. John's, Santa Maria, Barcelona, Istanbul, Tehran, Karachi, Colombo, Singapore, Manila, Osaka, Shitosi, Shemya, Anchorage, Seattle, Los Angeles, to Wichita. And we did it in uh, as a total elapsed time of uh, 65, tower, 65 hours and a flight time of 50 hours. And in 1966, that was a big deal, but anymore, I mean, that, that record's been halved. This is in Afghanistan. This is at the, uh, the uh, runway in uh, Kandahar. We had to, used to have to land there and get gas sometimes. And then we go on to uh, uh, Kabul. And that top picture is flying a, uh, forget what that, that uh, temporarily slipped my mind. This is with Jack Conroy. He designed the um, pregnant guppy. But this is a DC-3 with three engines, and he was wow. going he was going to sell it to the uh, Philippine Air Force, and I navigated it over to the Philippines with him, and he sent me that picture. I, mean, I got a bunch of pictures around. We went to from Santa Barbara to Honolulu to Majuro to Guam to uh, Clark Air Force, no, to uh, Manila International. This is flying a 707 for Trans-Mediterranean Airways. This is flying a Lockheed F-104. I got checked out in 1997. Uh, that was our first Mach 2 jet, and it's always been my favorite. And I just happened to have a friend that had one, and he let me check out in it. And uh, that was great fun. I got a videotape of it. This is Budapest, 1977. That's the chain bridge that we got briefed in the middle of it where we were going into um, down in uh, Somalia. And that's the B-26. Uh, well, above that is one of the secret airplanes. That's the one that uses the uh, pop-top dethermalizer um, technology that allows it to be uh, not called a rocket and allows us to transfer uh, more people up and down than we're normally supposed to. This is the B-26 that I flew in the uh, Reno Air Races. I actually passed a P-51, and uh, that's which, which is what, sorry? This. Uh, the B-76. B-26. Actually passed a P-51. And um, this is the Khartoum operation. That was Hank Wharton. He's the guy that we work for. And this is... Uh, Joe Weber, my engineer, and this was a uh, Khartoum or a Sudan co-pilot, and this was taken in Cairo, and that's in the cockpit. And there's another packed picture here. Oh, that's in Sana right there. Yeah, that's in Sana. This is flying the Learjet on a test flight. The Learjet was okay. flying here for. Um, <clears throat> that was a test flight, and then this is um, Nam Pen. I flew there for six months, that airline, and that airline is called Kamira Kaz. Merrily took those pictures for me. And then over up there is where it says the pennant. That's a America's Cup boat. I bought and uh, campaigned the soliloquy uh, for two years. It was one of the first America's Cup boats after they changed from the J-Class. Um, and changed over to uh, 12 meter. And uh, that's the Ford Air Control airplane, the FAC 02B that I ferried over from Wichita to Vietnam. And that's the twin, sorry, which one? This one up here, the, the Cessna 337. Yeah. It was outfitted with guns and uh, uh, it, they used to use it for forward air control. And this is an OV-10 and I used to fly up at the test site um, when you say the test site, you're referring to 51? Not, well, the test site is really the whole thing. Uh, Area 51 is part of the test site. Uh, but I flew in the other part, and what happened is when they'd set off underground nuke tests, they needed a plane up there to get samples of the, the winds before and after the test went off, so that if it vented, uh, they'd know which way the stuff was going to blow. And also, uh, if it vented to collect samples of uh, what it was. 
and that was an OV-10. We also had a B-26 and a uh, Beach Volpar and a Huey helicopter that I flew. What's your opinion about the crop circles that pops up everywhere? Uh, they're very carefully put there by others. I don't know too much about them. But as he will finish this. Uh, the top picture is uh, Howard Hughes' crew on the uh, first flight. Then below that is flying a vampire. And then this picture right here, P-51 Mustang, um, 1973, uh, Van Nuys, Zuchel gets shot down. And I had borrowed a guy's P-51, that one. And there was an ace of the base there that would continually brag about how good a fighter pilot he was. And uh, we finally got everybody out to... Uh, to be judges, and I took him up. Took him up. We agreed to meet at 8,000 feet, and I polished him off in about five minutes. And uh, so you can't see it well right there, but there's a picture of him with his pants down, and a, the big Z. His name was Zuchel, and my nickname was Howdy Doody. And so it says it's Howdy Doody time under there. This is one of the secret airplanes uh, comes through the atmosphere every once in a while. This is at Kandahar, parked out in front of um, the runway there. This is my brother, Bill Jr. And he's a pilot as well? Yes, he was. He was in the uh, Air Force, stationed in Germany in uh, 52, 53, 54. And then uh, he did all kinds of things, passed away a couple years ago. You can just take, they're all just a Merrily, so you can just, that's Merrily when she was a starlet when I met her. That, that's your better half, as we say. Right. And that's Soliloquy, the 12 meter. Is, is, is it your sailboat? Pardon? Is it yours? Yeah, it's 72 feet long, and... Um, Where is it? Pardon? Where do you keep it? It doesn't exhaust, exist anymore. I sold to a guy who took it to New Zealand and then scrapped it. Oh dear. Yeah, we do that in what we call the edit. Those. Oh yeah, sorry. All of those are speed records, diplomed a record by the uh, Federation Aeronautique Internationale. And they're all the speed records I held at one time. Uh, a lot of them have been broken, but anyway, I just put them all up there. That's very. That's good. This is Algiers. I was over there for a couple months in uh, 1986. It was just a, a lot of fun. It was a we were sub subbing for an airline over there. This is a certificate of achievement for special weapons. Uh, I graduated expert. I went through their whole couple months of courses there just to learn how to use weapons. Uh, this is Groom Lake at night. This is the main hangar right there. This is the uh, our plane and landing. You can just see that those lights going off and barely reflected in the uh, lake that's that uh, carries water every once in a while. And you can see the mountains in the back. Does that affect the the working conditions out there? What the water? Yeah. No, because it's always on the other side. All right. This is a flying saucer taking off from Groom Lake. This was taken by a friend of mine, and uh, you can see the saucer right there. And uh, if, He's standing outside of these this mountain range, and he just saw s something out of the corner of his eye, and just flicked at the camera, and then we enlarged it and found a real nice saucer. But you can see it's distorted there. <clears throat> and this is Bob. That's it. Uh, yeah. Bob who? Bob Lazar, and uh, um, I just put that picture of him. And then <clears throat> this is at my this is a long time ago. That's Marilee Kim and I kissed by me. This is. Lunar Orbiter 384M. This is a picture of a tower that sits in the middle of the um, uh, that sits in the middle of the moon as you visually look at it at night, and um, it's called the Sinus Medi. And that thing stands seven miles high. There's a tripod. It's all made of a glass type material, and on the top there's a, a cube. It's one mile on each side. And it stands there in the middle of Sinus Medi. And at one time, um, they sent 
uh, Joe McMonagle, who was one of the Army's premier uh, remote viewers, uh, to remote view the soul of a guy who had just been killed south of San Francisco. And he followed him towards the moon, and as he, he, he said as he got closer to the moon, in his ears he kept hearing, this is not your place, you may not come closer, you are not allowed here, until it got so loud that he had to break off the following. But he said that soul was going to the moon. That's when I came up with the idea that was a soul tower, and that was one of the transfer stations that you go through after you die until you get into the uh, lobby, or get into the uh, lobby and shown your past uh, or your uh, good things and the bad things that you've done during your life. This is Buzz Aldrin and me at the uh, 2001 uh, Aerospace something, I forget what it was. This is the Buker that I got, that uh, I had the accidental accident in. <clears throat> this is the F-104 that I had a chance to fly in. And these up here, this is all the certificates. When I quit flying, I just put all my licenses up here. And I'm the only guy that has all of them for the FAA. And they're all different ones here. This is airline transport pilot. And this is um, flight engineer. This is flight navigator, <clears throat> flight instructor, ground instructor, uh, airframe power plant instructor, aircraft dispatcher, senior parachute rigger, and control tower operator. And this we talked about before. The yeah, sticky we didn't that get that on, on camera. Do you want to talk about This is the sticky that went up on the um, above the seats on the 707 when we'd fly the Hodges. And that was to tell them how to use the... Uh, the bathroom because we didn't want him squatting on it so we put an X there and we put him had him sitting there and the Saudis who drew this and those to make it look comfortable for them they always had cigarettes so they showed them that they had their, could still have their cigarettes until it was not allowed to have cigarettes uh, on an airplane and so then they had to X out the cigarettes and they had to white it out there. <clears throat> Very practical. <laughs> so. And what's the significance of the 747 flying upside down? That's a 707, that was taken in 1955, oh. and that's uh, my friend, uh, <clears throat> he was the first test pilot of the uh, 707, and uh, they hadn't sold it yet, they were just uh, in the process of, of building it, and uh, Boeing management told him to go down to the Seattle boat races and, and and put on a good demonstration. And those are all the, the boats that were at the races. And this says, Sunday, August 7, 1955, Boeing test pilot Tex Johnson uh, rolls the 367-80 over uh, Seattle's Loop, uh, Lake Washington. And I got number nine of 707 copies of this. And Tex signed it. Um, real honor there. To roll this, a 707 before it's really flight certificated, that's a, that was a heck of a thing. No, it's, you know, no? It's, it's obviously, you know, it's a barrel roll. It doesn't put any extra Gs on it. This is the in interior of the uh, north face of the Copernicus Crater. And this is the one that really set me off exploring the moon. Because you can just look at this thing and you can see vapor there spraying up. If you see vapor, it's got to have an atmosphere because a vapor will not hold together in a vacuum. And there's a vapor, there's a vapor. Uh, up here uh, is a building. You can see it. I mean, it's obviously got uh, three or four stories. And uh, <clears throat> over here is a, um, <clears throat> I've got enlargements all this stuff. Wheel bus grader and that dust that's coming out of the top. Here's another bucket wheel excavator. If you really uh, focus into that, you can look at that, and that's that's a bucket wheel excavator, and it's working its way down that road there. And then, uh, there's all kinds of things on that photo. And finally, can we go to the bottom? Where do you want to go? Uh, what? Just whatever. This is all bullshit stuff, people I knew, places yeah. I flew. Okay. Uh, these are three pictures 
of the uh, moon. This is the backside, and uh, NASA really they uh, just released a picture uh, of the of the backside that they said was the uh, beautiful uh, highest technology they had. It's just horrible, but this is what it really looks like. And I got this uh, by hook and by crook, and you can see it's just beautiful, detailed. Uh, the contrast. Uh, the sharpness of the photo is what can be done, uh, but they don't do it. Did you find her? She is come back, but she's in the other house. I didn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Should I go and knock the door? Yeah. This is the, the big picture I showed you. This is uh, uh, Moscow Crater. It's on the back side of the moon. A lot of good, interesting stuff there. This is the... Uh, <clears throat> Front side of the moon, this is the view we see, and up there, that bright spot, that's the uh, uh, that's the crato, crater Aristarchus, and that's the 23 mile in diameter nuclear reactor. And the way we can tell it's a nuclear reactor is because uh, it, it puts out this blue color, and that blue comes from the Cherenkov effect when uh, radiation hits normal air. Therefore, saying there's, there's air there. Therefore, saying that it's a nuclear reactor. And air. And air, yeah. And air. This is the Tonopah test range, and that's where the uh, F-117 was kept at the beginning of the program. It's now used for several secret programs. This is the F-19 I told you about. This is the interior. This is the cockpit of the A-12, which was the forerunner of the YF-12A, which was the forerunner of the SR-71. This was a single place Blackbird, and uh, this is the artist rendition of the uh, uh, F-19, and this is a photo taken out of the shuttle of uh, one of the new pop stop, uh, pop stab uh, dethermalizer. Uh, what's is, the pop stab again, just briefly? That's when the wing uh, fold and come up, and it can just go like this all the way to the ground instead of making a re-entry at 18,000 miles an hour they can just float down and these wings this is an intermediate position some t the the two positions are out so it can fly like an airplane and the other is up like that so it can just float down with no forward airspeed and the other is completely tucked in so it can be launched like a rocket well, I think that's almost end of tape here. And uh, any any little final thing here? No, it's all these people I know. That's good stuff. Very proud. Anything here? That's that was Long Chin. That was the most secret CIA base in um, in Laos that we flew out of. This is me with General Vang Bao, the guy that we supported. Um, this is my congressional commendation for flying in Laos. That's me with G. Gordon Liddy. I'm not sure if you know him, but he this signed... This guy? Yeah. He was one of the White House plumbers, and he signed the... Uh, What's a plumber? Up, oh, I remember him. The guy that was mixed up in Watergate. Oh, right. And he's the one that signed that picture and says, John, I told him fucking nothing, G. Gordon Liddy. She <laughs> talked to me earlier about doing it. She says, no, she, she, we should have told her, so she had time to put on makeup and stuff. What do we do to protect ourselves from the uh, devilish things happening to ourselves here? You wear a tinfoil hat, but it has to be official. You can get an official John Lear one. Yeah. Uh, you can buy others. Or not just any old hat. It's no, got to be an official one. No, it should be. Um, this one is tested by Bob Lazar, who's done all the nuclear testing and, uh, and uh, chemical testing on this. And he My does God. absolutely... Um, recommend this one. There are others on the market, but they... Uh, but they can't possibly be as effective absolutely as Absolutely not. And the, the way you can tell, uh, it's, it's official. Some just say nothing, John Lear, but it's got to be official. John Lear, and then tinfoil hat. And then you look in the side there. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the great thing about this, that you can't do with any others, is pop popcorn and brew um, tea. And these are, of course, survival things that you've got to do after the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, this is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. But you can okay. only do that with an official John Lear tinfoil hat. My God. 
you are now fully protected and safe. Absolutely. And the rest of us here are in mortal danger. Absolutely. Thank you. My John. pleasure. John Lear, yeah. could you play us out of basis, please? <laughs> Thank you.